Hi everybody, this is A Witch Journal. I hope that you are doing amazingly. And I have with me today a really, really, really lovely person that I met through social media. Can you believe that? And they wrote this lovely book, Black American Magic, A Feast of Food and Folklore, which I also share in my Instagram as well. Um, Jay Flono is an opera singer, actor, and libertist from Brooklyn, New York. And their work has been published in African Voices magazine and 11 and a half literary journal. Hi, Jay. <laughs> hello, hello. How are you today? I'm exhausted, but I'm okay. I'm doing well. I want to say to everyone that, number one, this book is not fully focused on the type of magic that I practice, but this book has a lot of magic inside. And I think that before I start diving on the book and start talking about the book on itself, I want to get to hear a little bit about you, Jay. First and anything, uh, do you have a preferred pronouns? I, um, all pronouns are welcome. Um, but I, I typically just use gender neutral ones because it just makes things easy. It doesn't make sense. And, oh, I, it's, it, For those that are listening or seeing the video, if you notice like a little bit of change in the way that I'm recording this is because my computer broke and she hasn't had the opportunity to buy a computer yet. So we are utilizing mobile devices, but that on that side. Um, so Jay, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your journey as a writer, as a um, artist, as a libertist. You also touch on those elements in your book, but for those that haven't read it yet, let us know a little bit about that. Um, I'm originally from New York City um, with uh, family roots in the Deep South. I grew up in a very literary and musically inclined fam uh, nuclear family. My father is a reverend and a theologian. My mother was a classically trained singer and an actress. So You know, my love of words I got from my father and my love of music and the arts and beauty I got from my mom. And I grew up in the public school system of Long Island and um, I had the opportunity to be exposed to really wonderful teachers from the time I was. I remember the name of every teacher I've ever had since pre-K. I don't know if that's because I have an, a memory like an elephant or if because all of those teachers were so distinct and they impacted me in a specific way. But one thing I will say is that I had the opportunity to really be supported and nurtured by um, communities of educators who were involved in the arts. And these communities of educators were, major it was a majority, I, you know, I went to majority black and Hispanic school environments. And so a lot of the, a lot of my mentors in the arts, in writing, in music, from the time I was very small, um, were Black and Indigenous people. And so, yeah, I, I think I was really fortunate in the community that my my parents, especially my mother, um, intentionally put me in so that by the time I reached adolescence, I had already developed this very strong sense of a cultural connectivity and sensibility um, and not just as an African-American, but also the connection that I had to people from other parts of the world who were living in New York as well. So, yeah, I think that I was really fortunate and very blessed to have that experience because it's not it's not something that at least especially to, in today's world um which is increasingly becoming more in love with fascism and division and all those things and and anti arts and anti intel and anti intellect the world we live in now is increasingly become even more divided in in those ways but i i was happy that i got a taste of 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 that and then as far as my adult you know my artistic life in adulthood i went to a community college for humanities and social sciences because I was intent on becoming an English teacher. That original plan didn't work out. And then I eventually switched to music, which was my first love and got involved in opera, which is something that I had already been listening to since I was very, very small. And, you know, that part of my career 
has really taken off in many different many different aspects. And then as far as writing is concerned, I, I studied creative writing for a few semesters at Eugene Lane College of Liberal Arts. But I will say that a lot of my experience and craft in in writing has been more more so um kind of I don't want to say a lonely journey. But it's been a very, it's been a very solid, it's been a more solitary experience. More of a personal experience than anything else. Yes. Not whereas, entirely academically inclined. Not really. Whereas music and theater has always been a bunch of other people surrounding me, you know, whereas with writing, I've always been kind of in my own world and I didn't really consider a career in literature to be attainable for a very long time. So I had stopped seriously entertaining it, even though I was still always writing, whether it was short stories, hundreds and hundreds of poems, multiple novel ideas that I never finished. And only only recently when I decided to become an opera, become a librettist, which people don't know, a librettist is someone who writes the lyrics um, and the story. And here I am saying it as in Spanish, libretista. Ay, Dios mío. Not, I mean, that's not, that's not totally wrong because it is libretto. That's the Italian. It's a little book. So you're fine. Don't correct yourself. It's um, the Latino spicy flavor that we have here in this channel, I guess. <laughs> need that. <laughs> um, when I decided to become a librettist, I sort of created a secondary career for myself. And oh, as I was saying, as pe for people who don't know, a librettist is someone who writes the lyrics or writes the books for an opera. And so that part of my career has kind of exponentially developed in huge, huge ways since about 2017. And so, and I, you know, I've, you know, I was in a librettist fellowship with uh, this program called the American Opera Project. And I've been getting commissioned to be a librettist for several uh, classical projects. When it came to actually sitting down and deciding to funnel all of my years of ideas and materials into a book and actually finish a book. And for people who who know me very well, they will, t they will know that since I was about 13, I've been trying to write a book. <laughs> I'm really glad that I did not publish anything until I was in my 30s because I did not really realize it, but throughout my adolescence, I've been studying the, I've been studying the business and the art of publishing since about 2003, 2004. So I've seen publishing change so rapidly in that span of time. And as a result of that, I don't know, it sort of enabled me to be more confident and secure in my specific ideas without trying to alter or acquiesce to a to a market to a market model. And so I knew that this book would have to be something extremely personal. And I knew that it was something that I would not be able to traditionally publish because I'm an unknown author and unknown authors aren't really given carte blanche to write anthologies or things of this nature. This type of anthropological work, which is really what it is, more so relegated for people who are already established. But I decided to sit down and compile my years of varying interests into one thing. So yeah. folklore, fantasy, family yeah. history, all those things sort of uh, sort of combined and um, the result was this book that I finished in two years and you know this is not the book that I thought that I was going to publish first. Well obviously you do share some of the growth the organic growth of your book in the very beginning of it in the introduction. Allow me to say that something that I did love is how you mentioned that your friend Anansi called the project in progress a grimoire and allow me to read it, that you say, aha, uh -huh, a textbook of ceremonial magic. This was like, oh, this is a project that grew organically. And it has all the aspects of yourself that made you as a person, as an individual. It has magic, it has food, it has family, it has love, it has sadness. I told you. And I think that this is more in-depth with the... Um, the chapter where you talk about your family, your experiences, the chapter when I was reading that you talk about your mom's passing, I was crying and my husband was like, 
what's going on? And I was thinking about my own family losses and, and it's very personal. My mother always told me the story. She said that when I was around two and I was actually starting to form words, I was angry that I could not read. I kept seeing big people looking at all these symbols and I was like, what do these symbols mean? I was yeah. angry that I couldn't read so my <laughs> So my, my mom would take me in the car with her and she would drive around town and she would point out signs and read with me. And that's how I learned how to read. Sitting in sitting in the car seat. Sounding out, sounding out letters on billboards and street signs and all this stuff. That is how, it was my mom. She taught me how to, that, that's how I started. And so by the time I was four, I was already at like a really advanced reading level. And I feel, and, 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 and in some respects, I think that sort of, at like that advancement yeah. has ended up serving me very well in my adult life. Yeah. Because of my way to use words. Yes. But in but in hindsight, I'm also realizing that that advancement also worked against me sometimes because yeah. I was always ahead of everyone else and I was extremely bullied. So I had developed this persecution complex. And as a res and as a way of dealing with the bullying, I had right. decided that I was superior to everyone. Oh. It was bad. It was bad. It also led to me being a bit of an overthinker and always feeling like I had driven by my perfectionism. Then you compound that with neurodivergence that nobody was 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 helping me with. I was like, all right, um, there is a problem here. Yeah. How can we, what can we do to properly address it? Because my mother passed away when I was 27. So I wasn't necessarily able to go to her physically all the time now and ask her for, for guidance. Now she just comes in dreams um, and does stuff. Um, but it's not the same. So, yeah. you know, I was like, well, damn, what am I going to do? I literally, I literally just said to myself, it's time to stop daydreaming about finishing things and actually... Yeah do the work. I cannot sit online any longer and give the internet my ideas and daydream about my ideas. I was like, I have to do these things. And that was kind of personal. That was personal motivation. I used the negativity to fuel something positive. Um, but then, I mean, not all negative because there was a lot of joy involved in the making of this. And a lot of, a lot of this book also was inspired by, um, one of my original literary loves, which is Zora Neale Hurston, and you know my my family being from the Deep South and my father being from um, coastal Georgia and Florida, where Zora Neale Hurston did a lot of her anthropological research. My father introduced me to Zora Neale Hurston. I was very young, so I had already been like, oh. And then I remember, I remember in the the late two thousands, early twenty tens, I was tearing through her works. I was just like, I was eating it all up. So, in, and then, and then eventually I had started a, um, a Tumblr blog in 2010 called Zora's Creation. And I realized that a lot of that was, was, was because when I went through my own personal awakening, I guess uh, I went through several awakenings because I'm a Scorpio. This was happening to me when I went to a family member's funeral and I went down South and I had an experience in the woods. And then my my obsession with Black folklore and archiving our stories became, it just like amplified. Yeah. And then I was, and then, you know, I was really interested in um, doing genealogical work for my family because my family has on both sides. I'm fortunate that I was born into two families that, are full of griots. There are so many people in both of my mother's and my father's families who love to record history. They keep all the dates. They ask all the questions. They preserve all of the family relics. It's it's really, you know, I have a cousin who, who built a museum 
um, of artifacts from the antebellum period. Um, so it's, you know, I have another cousin who is a retired journalist and, and, and so it's, it's, it, it, this feels like I'm walking in my gifts. Yeah. It, so it makes sense that this, that this would happen so quickly and be received so, so beautifully and so well by people, because this is yeah. an echo of my family's ancestral connections to recollection and memory and storytelling. I come from a family of storytellers. You can notice it because of my accent, but I'm always very upfront of my roots. And I always reemphasize how important for me my roots are as an immigrant, as a person that comes from South America. And I could notice that you were in your book, in particular, the first chapter, when you talk about your family and your ancestry and where you come from, you were very adamant on reemphasizing what your family did, what the focus, not only on history, but also art and music and writing, it, how important that for your family was. I love our trends and I love pop music, but I also love to go to the roots where everything is stemmed from, where everything came from. And I feel that our society and even our generation have lost love for art, for tracking, for data, for keeping the, the proper information written down of not only our history, our past history, but how that history is evolving as on today. I do want you to start transitioning towards the, the magic aspect, because as you know, my channel, Baby Witch Journal, I, I typically talk about books, but also I focus a lot like on magic practices. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with an author called Mawiya Bomani, and she's a Hudu practitioner. Yes. Uh, her book, um, Conjuring the Calabash, is... I I'm love obsessed that with. name. Oh, my God. Conjuring the Calabash, it was her classes. I took a class with her about sex magic, and she talked about her book, and I'm like, girl, you sold me already with this, the sex magic class. Let's read the book. I waited for a whole year. <laughs> I was like, when is my book arriving? Um, and in the same way that her book is beautifully structured, that lady is beautiful. The way that Maria Bowman, she is just incredible. But I'm, I'm going on a tangent. Mm -hmm. Her practice was focused on Huru. And this is not necessarily a book of magic as yeah. in, let's do a ritual. But this yeah. book is magical. <laughs> yeah. I did that on if purpose. You, if you ask me, and I try to see between the lines with those recipes that you share here, because I'm also a cook. I've been a cook for 10 years of my life. I stopped cooking, like, professionally speaking. But once that you cook, you always cook. So that on that. And I was, like, kind of reading between the lines. And I'm like, mm, this is a perfect option for a love cake. Or this is, like, oh, this sauce is perfect. Like, when someone is sad, let's try to you know, amp up that happiness level. Like, this is magic right here. And I, and I want to say, like, this is food kitchen magic, but these are magical recipes with a lot of love and a lot of energy and obviously a lot of ancestral backup. So circling yeah. on those ideas, what is your practice? And tell us a little bit about your magic in this book. <laughs> so, I, so I, you know, I wrote it like that on purpose because I wanted, as a Scorpio, I love to be sneaky. Um, <laughs> so I, I love, I love to hide things under things in yes. plain sight and just wait for people to pick up on it and wink and then disappear in a puff of smoke. I'm a, I'm a hoodoo practitioner. I use the word hoodoo to describe uh, African-American old time religion. That's the umbrella term I use to describe to spiritual and religious practices maintained by enslaved Africans and their descendants in North America, which is a very specific and unique tradition in that like all trafficked Africans to the new to the quote unquote new world. Our ancestors were pulled from various different places across the continent as well as within the imperial core. And as a result, it reflects in the different families or tribes of uh spiritual lineages within our communities. Um and so those those can be Congo lineages, Senegambian lineages, Igbo lineages. Temne lineages, Yoruba lineages, various ones. And then how those how those spiritual lineages then cross-pollinated sometimes 
with the indigenous spiritual lineages on Turtle Island. So when we talk about this tradition as a spiritual practice, I've always considered, and it's something that is kind of rooted in my ancestry, that it's yes. it's, it's something that is both African and indigenous North American at the same time. Certainly. Because the practice is maintained on these lands, which ha already have their own original spirits, their own original contracts. But then those contracts the, then become open to people that have been trafficked, who have been intermarried, whose blood has been spilled in the ground, who have formed new identities like the Seminole Creek and and things like that, things of nature. And I say this as a person whose family um, is Black and Native, you know, um, and what was the second question? It was in regard to the magic that you have in this book, specifically, you know, with the recipes, the storytelling, we're going to talk a little bit more about yeah. the different stories that you created well, here. Uh, but yeah, more like on the food aspect, why food? So basically, I mean, the kitchen is a, is a central um, and sacred part of voodoo tradition, as it is for many similar traditions around the world. Oftentimes in oftentimes in voodoo practice, a lot of what people are are looking for, whenever I meet someone, a Black person in particular, who is like, I want to know about my ancestry. You know, I feel like I have ancestors who practice, et cetera, et cetera. I often not caution them, but I often tell them that a lot of what people are searching for in terms of quote unquote practical magic in that sense is is actually already at their fingertips it's in the kitchen because it is through often through culinary practice that medicinal recipes are transmitted yes. from yeah. typically from the mothers to the children and and medicine for healing as well as for harm because a large part of this tradition is rooted in self defense there is when i was constructing this i i all i wanted to make sure that i was writing something that would be accessible for people who aren't part of the who aren't part of the tradition and i just like oh i want to cook some food but yeah. but for people who are in the tradition or people who aren't in the tradition but still practice their own, they'll be able to read this and be like, oh, I understand. <laughs> I understand exactly what's going on here. So that's part of the so part of it is also it's it's this magic is hidden in the everyday. And I think that is what makes it so powerful and immediately connective because the properties, the spiritual and the physical properties of the elements and ingredients that we place in our food have a profound effect on us, not just physically, but emotionally, psychically. And so all of the building blocks of the recipes in this book, in some form, deal with traditional plant allies that Black Americans have cultivated or have served us spiritually in some sense. So yes. that's Car Carolina gold rice, hyssop, lavender, mullein, even, th even things as simple as bay leaf, okra, Another powerful one, one. whiskey. It's just like it, it's just so it's it's so it's um yams, sweet potatoes. These particular things, which to the naked eye, just like oh, it's just food. No, nope. for a conjurer and for a for a root worker, we're like hmm. You can do a lot. <laughs> do a lot with a lot of things. You can um, do a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For example, sweet potatoes being used for fertility. You know, but the thing is, like, I'm I don't I I don't say explicitly use this for fertility. I just say here's a sweet potato cake. <laughs> wink. <laughs> yeah, wink, yeah, wink. absolutely. You that, know, that's um, what I was saying. I feel that when you were to and, and again. First than anything, you are not going to say to me that you are going to call this book a grimoire and not put your magic in there. Let's begin there. Uh, second of all, when I was when I was reading, for example, that's toasted coconut cream cheese pound cake. I'm like, mm. immediately when I was reading the Aunt Beats yeast dinner rolls, I was already, it's just dinner rolls. But I know that when I am going to go to take food for my family, for example, and I'm just latching on what I will do. If there's any particular cousin that I have a spicy relationship with, and I say spicy in the sense of competitive, 
or maybe an aunt that I know that she, sometimes she daps a little bit too much. I immediately am going to be whispering to the soul, hey, keep her quiet. I don't want her, I don't want any type of argument in this reunion. You know what I mean? Like, hey, there is so much that can be achieved with food overall. And this yes. is just food. This is not necessarily connecting with the spirit of the plant. So I don't know. I, I find I, I find and that and, and that is and that is another dimension. Connecting with the spirit of the plant is another dimension. But there are there, but there are people who have those natural capabilities, they activate it without even trying. I did feel that reading this book was like talking with my best friend, listening to a podcast. I was having fun while connecting with the book. And at the same time, I was like putting the, the little dog ears in the pages, like, mm, I'm going to try this recipe. Do you have a particular one that you say, okay, this was meant for this? At least not on the love front, but uh, but there is the High John Neckbone Stew. That was a deliberate, uh, 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 a recipe made in deliberation. I don't know. I, I came up with it one night and I don't know why I just felt the need to call it that. And I think it was because I had been reading some High John stories um, yes. I listened to them, and there was one. There was one story that Zoro no Hurston co collected about High John tricking Old Master with his hogs, and so there was something about the the connection between pigs and hogs and Black spiritual tradition in this world. Because yes. one, I thought about the whole chapter that uh, where I was interviewing my grandmother about hog killing time yeah. when she was a little girl growing up in the deep south and she walked me through the whole process of how they would kill these pigs and use every part of the animal um yeah. to sustain their community and it, and then i thought about the importance of pigs in vodun tradition and i was like there's something about pigs community sustenance and liberation and i don't know what it is in particular but there's something that but there's something, which is why I decided that this neck bone stew had to be made with pork neck bones. Because I grew up eating neck bones. Like, neck bones is, I love neck bones. Neck bones and rice, neck bones and okra. And neck bones are a part of the animal that most most white people would not typically, were, were not typically eating. But we ate it. And when I decided to create this, I knew I wanted the flavor profile to reflect or to represent certain spiritual ideas. And I remember when I first shared the recipe with someone on a Black cooking uh, group on Facebook, they said, does the stew have high John root in it? I said, no, that's poisonous. But I said, but I said, this recipe calls on elements which represent high John's persona and the yes. five spirits of those he represents enslaved peoples who dare, who dare to choose freedom in yeah. face of torture or physical death. Pork neck bones, unlike the flank and the shoulder, are a traditionally undesirable part of the animal that many of our ancestors have used to create meals. Guinea pepper, which also flavors the dish, is the physical connection back to the culinary roots of West Africa. Whiskey represents the strength and ingenuity of Black American brewers like Uncle Nearest. Scotch bonnet's heat represents the link between all enslaved peoples, traffic through the Caribbean and into Turtle Island and vice versa. And the molasses, a traditional sweetener for our people who cannot afford sugar or honey, represents the great binding elements to hold all things together. So it kind of creates its own, its own potion in essence. Like I could, you know, I, you know, and people are free to create that dish and use it spiritually in, in ways that will serve them or whatever their needs are, you know, maybe somebody will prepare that dish for a family to give them strength before they go out and bury someone, you know, it, it's, it's, it's many, it's many different, many different things. Yeah. Maybe that is a dish that could be shared between a table of people made up of different people from, a, from the diaspora. So we can stop yes. having these diaspora wars. I don't know. Yeah. So, Yeah. I had a mayor freak out when I was reading about the Russian tea and how the list of a full list of ingredients is in page 394. But you know, in the witch community, there is a large discourse about close practices. And I guess that this is a close practice within your book. And I respect that. <laughs> there is a particular story about the Russian tea and how it is prepared within Jay's family. And um, Jay's, it's a tease <laughs> because Jay was teasing us with the recipe and full list of ingredients. And the full list of ingredients is nowhere to be found in the book because we're never going to get to know that. And that's okay. We, I respect that. But you're a tease. 
<laughs> my grandmother would kill me. She would kill me. Yeah, she would kill me. So I was like, no, I can't. I was like, I can talk about how she makes this special tea. I'm the first person she gave the recipe to. She has four children. She didn't give it to any of them. She gave, <laughs> she gave me the recipe. And she's been making this, she's been making this brew since about 1953 or so. Every every holiday without fail. And Russian tea, people don't know. It's a it's a not as well known southern beverage delicacy that is typically imbibed around the holiday time, but it's black tea citrus and spices what kind of black tea what kind of citrus what kind of spices differs from family to family but we have our own way of making it that is very time consuming and very involved and so when my grandmother gave me the recipe she said don't share it with anybody else i was like yes ma'am so <laughs> when i when i put it in the book i made it seem as i was going to give the recipe out but I say, for the full list of ingredients, turn to page 394. This book only has 200 pages. <laughs> and it was also a Harry Potter reference. Um, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> we saw that. <laughs> oh, God. May Alan I, didn't want to, I didn't want to assume that, but I definitely was seeing, like, after I got that, I was like, did I just got Severus's name with this? <laughs> turn to page 394. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, oh my, well, anyways. Hey, uh, Alan, Alan Rickman, rest in peace. To start diving in, the last part of your book that focus on the folklore and the stories, because again, I do utilize many magic systems within your book, <laughs> and fantasy creation is one of those. That's, again, that's why I was obsessed with the book. I love fantasy, I love food. I love chatting with my friends and I love, you know, my sorcery, sprinkle, sprinkle. You created a few stories in the version that I have of the book, Reasons Beyond Your Control. I have five stories, but it is my understanding that you wrote how many stories? Seven. Seven. Tell us a little bit about that. So in the book that I have, I have five stories. The first one is The Song of the Sacred Beast. The second one is Our Farfin, Don't Ate All the Fruits. Mm -hmm. um, the third one is Her Prince Among the Spirits. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is uh, Leogenda. And the fifth one is uh, Devil Branches. Care to share the name of the last two stories? Please? The last two stories, which are, they are Cat Snow Rose. And these, the last one is an excerpt from the Vine book, which is a novel in progress. Yes, you do share in your book that you are actively working on other mm -hmm. books as well. The first particular story, The Song of the Sacred Beast, it was a story that I had to read slow. I definitely feel that this story has anything to envy from the Silmarillion. And the level of animism that this story has is mind-blowing to the point that everything is a lie. But I don't want to start talking like crazy. I think that we can utilize this third part to talk more about the fantasy, the stories that you're creating, the reason behind them. Please care to share a little bit about that. All of the, all of the stories in the third section of the book are short stories that I've completed. I would say, and I would say all of them, the only story that's new, uh, as in I wrote it last year, uh, is Song of the Sacred Beast, Her Prince Among the Spirits, Fleogenda, and... Moss Fairy Thinned and Ate All the Fruit. So I wrote four short stories last year, which went into this anthology, whereas, whereas Devil Branches, Cat Snow Rose, and The Vine Book have already been done. I wrote Cat Snow Rose in 2018. I wrote Devil Branches in 2017. And The Vine Book I've been working on for years. So I, I wrote here, the city of Zar is one of several Negro mythical places that Zora Neale Hurston outlined in her research alongside Diddy Wa Diddy, West Hell and Balufa Hatchie, places just beyond the zenith of our folkloric imagination, places that have inspired me. As someone who has been a hungry reader of high fantasy, magical realism and speculative fiction since childhood, one element that has until recently always been missing from the mainstream fantasy titles crowding my shelves were works inspired by African-American and Caribbean folklore. The only recourse I had from models in writing fantasy were largely white authors. Tolkien, Tamara Pierce, J.K. Rowling, Philip Pullman, 
Garth Nix, Cornelia Funka, Brian Jex, and Ursula K. Le Guin, each of them having a positive effect on me in their own way. In truth, Tamara Pierce and Ursula K. Le Guin were the first and only white fantasy authors I read whose leading characters such as Ged of Ten Alders and Daja Kisuba were people who defied the largely white male and heterocentric character models dominating much of fantasy. So in 2001, between avoiding pre-algebra homework and dancing to Destiny's Child songs in Radio Disney, I yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I first began consciously writing secondary world fantasy, creating maps, proto-languages, and fantastic races. From 2001 to 2006, my leading characters were decidedly white, heroic, straight, and male, with two or three others. Change seeped in incrementally. I began writing all female characters, and slowly they began to ethnically diversify. Soon, I had created a fantastic tapestry of Black and Indigenous people in my fiction. As I grew older, I read more widely. Toni Morrison, Zorna Hurston, Maurice Condé, N.K. Jemison, Octavia Butler, Nalo Hopkinson. I found my way into Charles Chestnut, Marlon James, and Samuel R. Delaney. I sat at the foot of Virginia Hamilton's works and asked myself, what would a secondary world look like with African-American folklore culture as its heartbeat? Our culture in all its witty, pugnacious, and sagacious glory. Our culture magical, unfiltered, and sometimes touched by, yet not always defined by slavery and Jim Crow. Would slavery as we know it even have to exist in this secondary world at all? How could the destiny of things be shaped and changed? Where would we be? How would we be shaped? What half-remembered myths could be rewritten and reimagined in ways that connect to the continent? What ancient practices could be preserved in a new fashion and filter through the lens of fiction to shine a light on other truths. Out of these inquiries came the world of the folks realm and all the lands therein, an alternate incarnation of our primary world. The folks realm is known by many other names, the world of many watas, the mere lands, the weird world, the dark side of the earth. The folks realm is the world if the seemingly divided planes of fairy and humanity were more naturally coeval and then merged into one space over time. These events have significantly shaped their world so much that in history, economies, national boundaries, philosophy, technological development, and even religion, the folks realm is similar to, but does not completely resemble our earth. The stories and poems in this small collection are built on 22 years of imagining and reimagining creation and destruction, growth and restoration. And after all this time, I welcome the world to my world. Each story and poem in this small collection is a smaller part of a larger whole, telling a series of interconnected narratives over a time that spans millions of years, beginning from the very primeval days of the world to a, to a time period that is closer to the late 18th slash early 19th century. That introduction uh, really helped me decide on what, ex what the stories each were going to focus on and yes. So each of the stories in that in that in that collection, they're in chronological order. The Song of the Sacred Beasts is a prehistoric, ancient creation myth where there's no humans, no fairies on the planet as no of nothing. Yet. Yeah, nothing but gods and mushroom oh, creatures. Yeah. Um, and then as we go on, the second story, Mars Farifend and Ate All the Fruits, is an ancient story that in my mind has been translated. So one thing about it is that each story also deals with food in its own way. And I did that deliberately. And the, yeah, so Mars Farifrin that ate all the fruits is a cautionary tale about eating fairy fruit and what it can do to you. The third story, Her Principle on the Spirits, I have taken the story of High John the Conqueror and I have given him this epic backstory. I do want to do a High John novel about him like that story is actually, I think, is the beginning of a larger, of a larger, of a larger novel at some point. Yes. Um, but it's about his origins um, on this fairy island. The third story, Fleogenda, which was actually one of my favorites to write. It was, and it was, I think it was the most dramatic. Uh, my friend read it. He said, that woman gave me Ajita. I said, I know she did. <laughs> that story is much further on in history 
where there's a lot more humans involved in things and you see how that has changed the nature and the shape of things. And then by the last story, that's that's which is the Vine book excerpt that takes place in a more 19th century, many, 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 many years span time. I love to see that the morality in the each story there's like not a moral structure. Obviously, we can have a dichotomy of good and evil, but we can also see like very human-like experiences, suffering, pain, sadness, happiness, destruction. We can get to see the evolution of these different characters on each, on each story. And what I loved in particular with the first story is the amount of the spirits and how these primordial beings give us a result, the entire existence, the universe. Obviously, we see more different elements in the further stories, but I like to utilize the first one, especially as an animus, to reemphasize how you can find life on everything and how one decision causes another series of events. It was beautifully structured. It was hefty, and I sat down actively trying to digest what it was being fed to me. The Song of the Sacred Bees, that took a lot of energy to write. I had to put my mind in a very primordial headspace. I had to imagine things that I personally have never... It's easier to write magical stories that have humans in them, obviously, because we're human, I understand. But when I'm writing from the perspective of things that are not, not only are they not, them not being human is not really the main, they are, they're not, they're not even fairies. They're, be, they're, they're, they are forces. So putting myself in the mind of a primordial force of nature, imagining what inspired the, their actions, what inspired their actions, and also how I could use natural biological processes as like a way to highlight these particular battles yes between these forces so that yes. way the multiple ice ages is actually an ice spirit the trying to protect creation from extraterrestrial demonic forces <laughs> that are trying to, that are landing on the planet in as in the form of asteroids. It's it's things like that that I'm just like oh god, and and I feel definitely in finishing it, I I was able to kind of understand the building blocks of my world magical structure. Like these are the things that gave my world its power later on. All of the characters later on, millions of years later, they are all walking in the shadow of all of the, and they don't know about these things. As powerful as my characters are, very few of them know about these things. I would say perhaps two of them know about it only because they were told by someone other than that, especially the humans. They do not know. <laughs> have no idea. <laughs> they do not know any of this. And I feel it made it feel more concrete. Because if everyone knows all the ancient magical history, it becomes boring. I like it when the people don't know the whole story. You did share that you are working on other projects. Yeah, what are you looking to do in the future? Right now, I'm currently working on, I am 80,000 words into my Hoodoo Futurist fantasy novel. Yes. Which I am going to have traditionally published. That book is so special to me. Because it it it's something that it's something in fantasy that I've wanted to see more of and I don't really see it enough. But it's a fantasy world that's modern. Because typically they stay in the medieval era or the yeah. pseudo-medieval era. I have moved time far, far in advance. And it's been so rewarding to write a fantasy world that has contemporary comforts in it, to see how magic and technology merge merge and sustain for for good reasons and for not so good reasons to see how they sustain and support each other and to yes. also i've also like created my own pop culture and that has actually been able it's been able to help me that creates an even bigger distance between the old histories and what people are doing currently so forget about the prehistoric stuff a lot of the other stories in this the people in the model don't know anything about those either or they have half truths that get taught to them in schools about well, why are there no more fairies? It's like oh, well, they just decided to leave. 
No. No. <laughs> I love that. Them all, I'd actually like to read a piece of one of the stories. I would love to get to hear a little bit of the, at least of the last two that I did not read. I have access to the, the first five. I'm going to read a bit of Cat Snow Rose. There is a popular Creole folktale called um, Good Blanche, Bad Rose, and the Talking Eggs. Um, and there was a popular storybook when I was a child based on that story written by Robert Sanssouci. This, the original, that story is about two sisters, Blanche and Rose. Blanche is treated like crap by their mother. And Rose is really, and Rose, her sister, is spoiled rotten. And the two of them, well, one day Blanche is sent to go get water from a well. And she meets an old woman who, who is a conjure woman, definitely. Um, yes. And the old woman on the road gives her these instructions and asks her to give her a drink of water. And then she gives her a drink of water and she says, God, and she says, you'll be blessed. Eventually what happens is um, the mother finds out she gave the woman this drink of water and she beat her. And the old woman tells Rose to go to the chicken house and get some talking eggs and to follow very specific instructions. The ones that say, yes, pick them up. The ones that say, no, let them be. Blanche obeys and she brings the eggs back home. And then out of the eggs comes diamonds and gold and beautiful things and she basically becomes wealthy rose does not obey auntie does the opposite of what she tells her to do and snakes and scorpions and things come out of the eggs and they you know they beat her up and the story kind of ends I i'm truncating but the story kind of ends there and i know what the themes are that it's trying to impart however i was like i feel like there's more to this story so i wrote a sequel, I guess, to what happens to Blanche after that, what happens to their mother after that, and what happens to Rose. So this story is from Rose's perspective. She's not a little girl anymore. She's a grown woman now. Blanche has left home. Of course she did. And is living very wealthily. And Rose has also married uh, a nobleman as well. But the thing is, is that their mother, who, who's been who had been beating Blanche all her life, their mother is extremely sick. And Rose comes to the old woman and asks her for something to heal her mother. And the old woman gives her instructions to follow. And once again, she does not follow the instructions. Oh, girl, bye. And in my story, this it, so this story, Cats No Rose, deals with, deals with those things, but it also deals... One element that came out to me was the element of of colorism involved in the family yes. dynamic. I had decided that Blanche, whose name means white, was actually the darker skinned child, and and her her the deepness of her skin was one of the reasons why her mother treated her so badly. Also, the, one of the interesting things about the story was that some of the words are in Louisiana Creole. For cats, no rose. Once lived a lady with daughters too, sister Blanche and sister Rose. Blanche get hate, Rose get love, cat snow rose, hey, cat snow rose. Lady Rose Pulo de Monte is a woman, and the farthest she's ever been from home, the farthest from the village of Mortan. She's come this far by faith to change her fate. She sees the witch woman hunched over in her garden, draped all in black in the sticky summer heat. The witch woman's rickety brown and cream house stands at the edge of a magnificent woodland brushed with colors of gold and green. Mosquitoes dance around her pitiful pond. She mutters and munches a strange herb so bitter, Rose can smell it from where she stands. Rose remembers that the witch woman only answers to the name of Aunt. Bonjour, Tante, she says in a sweet, childlike way. I always loved your garden. Let me. The witch woman jerks her head up, spitting the herbs in the ground. She pulls down her hood and whirls on rolls in a flurry of black cloth. You know that's not my name. I am Grand Medou. You come here for something? You spit it out right. Pay your fare and go on somewhere. Don't waste my time, girl. Please, Grand Medou, Rose says in a small voice. I've come for healing. My mama is sick. So sick. She needs your medicine. S'il vous plaît. La médecin. Grand Medou's brown leathery skin seems, seems to shine. Your mama took ill? 
<laughs> what your mama needs, even Sperry Bonjean can't provide. What went wrong with her? Her heart. It's broken, Grand Maidou. <laughs> Liquor? Broken? <laughs> Grand Maidou spits the last of the herbs on the ground and licks her shining teeth. Pourquoi? Who could break something that never existed? Rose pulls the name of the one who broke her mother's heart out of her memory like a drawing a knife from a wound. My little sister, Blanche, she left us and my mom feels to die. Blanche was sent to get water from a well. Cat Snow Rose, yes, Cat Snow Rose. Old auntie came upon her and said, my tongue is ever dry long so. Blanche gave auntie a taste so clear. Cat Snow Rose, yes, Cat Snow Rose. Thank you, child, said old auntie. Bonje will bless you as you go. Grand Maidou stands to her full height, gripping the rusted gate around her little house. She blinks rapidly. Then a loud, wild, unkind laugh escapes her wrinkly lips. I'm big fan. Stupid girl, I know the stories. Black Blanche and Light Rose, two sisters alike and unalike, one despised, one beloved. All cause your precious mama could not keep a promise to thy grandpapa, the little half fay pas blanc from Borsellian, who owned his own daughter as a slave. Keep the line pure, pure as death. Those are your family's words, and that is your family's destin. When Rose tries to speak, Grand Maidou shakes herself in rage and continues on. You and your mama go both got what you deserved. Treated Blanche like l'esclave all her life and get mad when I bless her and not you? Your mama is a wicked bitch and you follow after her like a pig to demon slop. You could have been a great sorcier like Blanche, but you chose to squander your talent and pursue foolishness. Opening your legs and cavorting with mortal princes. Disgusting. I have no time for fools. Kite, he rolls. I never come back. Jamie, kite. Rose shudders and falls, pushed into the dirt by the weight of an invisible hand. The finery of her white cotton gown is brown with mud and manure. She calls out, Grand do, please, please. Knees digging in the rocky dirt. Rose jams her hand in the small purse of coins attached to her waist. Rose throws it headlong into Grand Maidou's garden and it falls pathetically in her spider-like fingers. Mother beat on Blanche so bad. Cats no rose. Yes, cats no rose. Blanche ran away to the woods and trees, crying out, cats no rose. Old auntie appeared and then she asked, little child, why do you cry out so? Mama has showed me hate with her hand. My sister laughs and scorns my soul. Little child, I beg you, come with me. So your soul will be no more, cat snow rose. Food and drink await you beyond, but you must not laugh or become cat snow rose. Ha! A bag of bones? Keep this, t rose. Grand Maidou throws it back over the garden gate, and the little sack of money bursts into flames before it hits the ground. No, no! Screaming and retching and banging on the ground, tears fly down Rose's face as she crawls back to her feet, reaching out. Please, Gourmet, please, please, please. I can't let my mother perish. I won't let this happen to her. I never would have done all those things to Blanche if I knew this would happen to us. I don't want my mama to die. Please, Gourmet, have mercy on me. She can't die. I have no sister, no mother, no family, nothing left. I'll never abandon love and magic if you help me. I'll never do it again. Jame, Jame, please, please help me. Grand Maidou regards Rose for a tearless moment in time. She swivels her knowing gray eyes over Rose, Rose's shivering body, cocks her head to the side once, twice, three times, and whispers, Promete? You promise to never abandon love and magic again, T. Rose? Rose's throat quivers in silence. She looks up at Grand Maidou through cloudy eyes. Yes, I promise. Mouva jamais abandonner l'amour et magie. Grand Maidou beckons Rose. Come here, T Rose. Gade, gade. She brings Rose to a bushel of innocent snowdrops, blooming near a trellis overrun with azaleas, the shade of blood. With careful fingers, Grand Maidou picks a single snowdrop in her hand, turns it three times, and says, Changez pour toujours noir comme l'amour. The snowdrop turns black as turpentine. Rose's nostrils flare in disgust, but she changes her face to a broken smile when Grand Maidou turns to look at her. Ça c'est essence de noix Marie, Grand Maidou whispers. Take this straight to your mother, T-Rose. Turn this to powder and put it in her food. Make for her a feast of smothered black cat liver, eggs, and unripe fruit. Make her eat it. Then put the rest of the powder in a cup of whatever she feels to drink and draw the shades for three days. You hear me? 
Rose nods and turns to leave, but then Grand Maidou's sharp fingernails dig into her arm and she pulls her back like a rag doll full of pins and looks into her eyes. Listen, be very careful out yonder in Wickedy Woods. The voice of the wood is full of secrets and you must never, ever, ever use any sorcery against any creature in its depths. Do you understand, T. Rose? Do you understand? Yes. Yes, I understand, says Rose, wistful and sighing and holding the blackened snowdrop in her fingers. She puts the flower in a deep fold of her stained gown and turns to leave. Grand Maidou calls after her one final time and says, All that is white is not pure. All that is black is not ugly. Remember, T. Rose, always act with love and you will find your magic. And so that's part one of the story. And so Rose goes on a little quest, bringing her mother this blackened snowdrop uh, powder. And she goes to she goes into the woods. And yeah, pretty much everything that Grand May do told her not to do, she does. So yeah. That's about right. <laughs> yeah. The simple act of following instructions. I want to say that your book in particular, and again, this is a channel about witchcraft and magic. And I do think that you can find a lot of wisdom within this storytelling. And you can find a lot of magic within your book. Um, I want to invite everyone to support Yay and buy Black American Magic. I really hold this book very, very dear to me. The mere fact that you are here as you are, as the universe made you, and um, you elevate the roots of your family, of yourself, of your ancestors, and also you give. You know, you add that little spice of yourself, an extra twist and flavor to it. And the quality of it, I was in love. I love a good fantasy book and I love the fantasy storytelling that you share. Um, so yeah, I want to invite everyone to say, to participate, to support you. Do you have a particular timeline or time frame for, uh, for when the next project is going to be? I want to, so the reason my, 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 my novel currently, um, uh, which I am not revealing the title of, but it is currently called, I just call it my Hoodoo Futurist Fantasy Novel in Progress, or I also call it The Fig Book. At this current rate, I think I'll be able to finish this book, finish this draft especially, by the beginning of summer. As, and as far as Black American magic is concerned, I, that will take a little bit more time because I do need to do some traveling to compile the next uh, rounds of recipes and interviews. I have lots of people on my list that I want yes. to speak with. And um, some of them are in my family, some of them are not. But I'll be going down south in August, so I'll be able to do get started on the next Black American Magic um, volume very, very, very soon. So you are going to make multiple volumes of the same yeah. um, work frame? Okay, yep. in the same work frame. Okay, okay. Yep. So in the next volume, it's also going to have obviously recipes and an anthology of stories as well. I'm not sure about the anthology of stories, or maybe maybe it will, but I don't think it'll. It, it the stories may be different. Just go around. Um, I'm also thinking about collecting stories from other people from word of mouth, and transcribing them with their permission. I particularly think I'm very lucky. Of having met you and having found these, because I think that this is hard to, this is a type of book that is very hard to find. And I hold it very, very dear to me. So I'm very happy of connecting with you. And I'm very happy that this is out there because this particular book is not necessarily focused on witchcraft or magic, but it has, you know, the <laughs> uh, with <laughs> recipes inside. Do you have a particular juju or spell or recipe that you could share the, or point from this book? It's really, it's the High John Stew. That one, that is something when applied with prayer, that is a dish that can be used for protection. Yeah, for fortifying spiritual defenses, 100%. Especially because of the inclusion of guinea pepper in the uh, in the making of the dish. The high John stew yes. would probably be the one. Yeah, that is it. the one. But yeah, this is pretty much it. I want to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity just sitting down here, all pals, just drinking coffee and talking about life. <laughs> coffee is done. Um, and I want to invite everyone to follow Jay 
um, follow their social media, please participate of this project, let's support. I want to invite, I keep re-emphasizing everyone to connect, follow, subscribe, share, like, ask questions, make comments, go and participate of um, Gay's projects. I'm friendly, uh, so and Instagram is <laughs> Instagram is typically the quickest way to reach me through social media, so. This is Gay Tanclono, wonderful author and writer, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>